One of the most interesting discoveries that's been made by the James Webb Space Telescope is the analysis and discovery of jumbos, Jupiter mass binary objects. These are objects with roughly the size and mass of planets like Jupiter, maybe even down to Saturn, some are larger, that are in the Orion Nebula. What's really strange is that about 9% of these are in wide binary orbits where you've got two objects with roughly the mass of Jupiter orbiting around each other. And since their discovery, astronomers have been absolutely puzzled at how you could get such a thing. Do they form in place? That doesn't make sense. Are they ejected from existing star systems? That doesn't make sense. My guest today has a third theory. My guess is Jessica Diamond, she is a master's student at the University of Sheffield, and she conducted a project with Dr. Richard Parker on the photo evaporation of stars as an explanation for jumbos. In other words, these Jupiter-sized planets were actually once stars, maybe even more massive than the sun. And being around so many enormous, bright, hot stars, wore them down, sandblasted them away, bullied them to become much smaller objects. And that would explain how you could have binary stars, which is very common, ending up being binary Jupiter-sized objects. So if that possible solution intrigues you, enjoy this conversation with Jessica Diamond. Jessica, can you give me a sense of how we first learned that these Jupiter mass objects exist in nebulae like the Orion Nebula? Yeah, so I mean, we know that objects that are substellar, so brown dwarfs, planetary mass objects such as rogue planets, they exist. Um, but two astronomers, Samuel Pearson and Mark McCochran, were doing a um, research into the Orion Nebula cluster, into the trapezium cluster within the Orion Nebula. And they did a near-infrared survey using the James Webb Space Telescope on their near-cam, so near-infrared survey camera. And they used a range of filters in order to try and see extremely low-mass objects. And they found what appears to be these 540 planetary mass objects. And of these objects... 9% they thought were found in wide binaries. And this came as a surprise because way fewer high mass binary systems tend to be found. And they found that they weigh between 0 0.6 to 13 times the mass of Jupiter. Now, now, there were hints that these things were there before that, right? Observations had been made with Hubble and other infrared instruments detecting them, but, but Webb sort of improved the detection limit. Yeah, because Webb is designed to be more sensitive than past telescopes that we've used. It can use a wide variety of filters and wavelengths in order to view new objects and reach better depths. Yeah. So we've got these observations of these objects. And like if we were to sort of see them here in the solar system, is, do we have a an analog? So in terms of size, like I said, they are about 0 0.6 to 13 times the mass of Jupiter. So this is around a little bit bigger than Saturn, around Jupiter size to 13 times Jupiter size. So that's pretty big, uh, bigger than any planet in our solar system, but a lot smaller than the sun. Like bordering on, on brown dwarf size and mass. So brown dwarfs have a limit and their mass limit is less than or equal to 0 0.08 times the mass of the sun. So this is their upper limit. So their lower limit is a lot lower and kind of borderlines, everything kind of overlaps. And if they're, and so the lower limit of a brown dwarf would be around 10 Jupiter masses. So there is that small overlap there. Right. Yeah. Um, pe people always ask me, like, you know, when would Jupiter turn into the sun? Right. We, and, you know, only if you could find like another 80 Jupiters and mash them all together can you finally get to like the smallest possible star. So it's, I mean, I, I think it's it's kind of amazing that that these things have have been discovered because they really are tiny 
astronomically speaking compared to the other kinds of things that are in these nebula. You know, you, I, you know, whenever I do astrophotography, I have to do a very short exposure on the trapezium part of the Orion Nebula because it's so bright. There's so much going on there. So we've got these objects and and the sort of the really intriguing discovery was this idea that that yeah, nine percent of these are in wide binary. So so give us a sense of of like what is a wide binary? So we view objects in binary systems and we have what's called multiplicity which is when we view different types of stars and substellar objects which are in binaries, triple, quadruple, continued systems. And we call them separations is how far away they are. So we have, we have a function for these and you can see, you would assume that the bigger objects would be the ones that are really far apart from each other because they're so big, they can be orbiting a center of mass and still stay in these binaries. And the smaller the object gets, the smaller the you would assume the binary separation to be. But because we found these objects, and these objects weirdly appear to peak, their binaries appear to peak within A-type binary sort of distribution. Their distributions are between 25 and 390 astronomical units. Hmm. Right, right. So like w way out beyond the orbit of Pluto in the solar yes. system. Yeah. Um, like binary stars are very common. I mean, we we see them and, the, and as you say, you know, the multiple star systems, like this is very common. And I think the mechanism for how you get a binary star is fairly understood that you that you've got, or, you know, maybe it maybe now there's a big argument, I don't know, but, but that, that two clouds of gas separately form and orbiting each other, and you get the star, especially in the wide binary format. So why were the jumbos, these Jupiter mass objects in a binary configuration, wide binary, why was that considered so surprising? Well, like I said, with the objects, so we have brown dwarfs, and you see brown dwarfs in binaries, but their binary mass fraction is low, and they're also a there's also a separation of around four astronomical units for these brown dwarfs. And if you're thinking of objects that are even smaller than brown dwarfs, you would think that they would have even smaller separations, but they don't in terms of the research that Pearson and McCochran found a year ago. Huh. So, so if you sort of have this continuum of stars or two objects that are orbiting around each other and you're comparing their masses, you get this, they get the, the less massive they are, the closer they get to each other. Yes. Or they should. And essentially. They should. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you've got these outliers that are way outside of this typical distribution curve that should be getting in this direction. And, and so I mean, I guess, did they find anything that, that fit the curve or were they, or were they almost like too close to, you know, could they not distinguish them? I think it was so hard even to distinguish them in the first place because it's 2023 that this information was released, 2022 when they did the survey. So it's just um, crazy that this could be a thing. And yeah, there might be smaller binaries, but these this actually hasn't really been looked into much yet. So rogue planet binaries isn't, as far as I know, a big topic. Right, right. And, and, and I think, you know, when I think about how even with telescopes like TESS, astronomers are still arguing about whether or not this star or that star is a, is a binary, you know, an eclipsing binary, or whether it's just one star. And that's a star. So to try and sort of figure out, oh, no, these, what looks like this one little blob in the Orion Nebula is actually two Jupiter mass objects orbiting each other within an astronomical unit. That sounds like tricky work to try and sort out. So let's, let's go back and talk about the wide binaries and not speculate on the, on the close binary. So, so then what were the proposed mechanisms for how you might get these wide binaries? So the most common theory would be that they form like a star and like you said earlier with star formation, 
Uh, if they form like a star, there would be this missing mechanism that would cause such low mass formation of these objects. We Some brown dwarfs, we can't even consider that they form like stars because of how low mass they are. So for star-like formation, dense regions of gas and dust in a nebula that are gravitationally bound are susceptible to collapse. And you have what's called the opacity limit for fragmentation. And the minimum for this is 10 Jupiter masses. So it's hard to explain how objects could form like stars if their mass is less than 10 Jupiter masses or even, even slightly above because that is the minimum opacity limit. And in Pearson and McCochran's paper, they say that there would be a missing ingredient if it were to form like this. So that would be one way, but it's still, it's not been too looked into. And it's hard to imagine how such low mass objects could form like stars. So then we consider planet-like formation. Planets form around disks, in disks around stars, and this happens while the star is forming as well. And there's what's called the core accretion theory, which is how we thought that our planets in the solar system formed. But this is hard to explain planets that are have a mass that is greater than several Jupiter masses. So if this was the case, it is possible that these Jupiter mass objects could have been violently ejected. And this is because star forming region have many dynamical interactions because they're so close to other stars that if say a star passed them by, a binary passed them by, this could cause the whole formation, the planetary formation system to be disrupted and a planet would be ejected. But this raises the question of then how how could these be binaries in yeah. this case? Right. So you can get one, no problem. But two orbiting one another, mm -hmm. that sounds like a very delicate operation. And if you get 9%, that starts to defy comprehension. And in such wide binaries as well, it's, um, it's a mystery. So we also consider brown dwarf formation. And there are quite a few theories of brown dwarf formation because, again, they fall into this substellar category that we, we didn't know for sure that brown dwarfs existed. We had no concrete evidence until 1995. So this is also such a new topic because, and so there are so many new formation theories coming out. So we have, you know, the classic star-like formation, planet-like formation for brown dwarfs. We have um, binary ejection, and then this other theory, which is our idea, is this theory of photo erosion that was suggested by Whitworth and Zinnaker in 2004. Hmm. So, and this is the heart of your paper, the one that sort of had me, triggered me to reach out and, and schedule this, this interview because I... It was a, you know, I, I have been reporting on these jumbos since their discovery. And it's, and it's very much, be, you know, either they formed in place or they were rejected and they found one another. Both of those seem really weird, uh, but that's all we got. <laughs> but it's got to be one of those two. But you're proposing, no, actually, it could be a, a third way. And it's pretty weird. Pretty cool. Yeah, so these were um, written about actually a few weeks ago in the New York Times, and they were described as stellar victims of stellar bullying, which I thought was a really interesting way of putting it. Yeah, I, I think I described sandblasted is the way I had been describing it. But but so what is the mechanism? This photo erosion? What's going on? So photo erosion is a process that, firstly, you have to be near massive stars. So these are O and B type stars in terms of spectral type. And these O, B stars have H2 regions. And these are regions surrounding the star with ionized hydrogen and they're highly turbulent regions. So our theory is that stars that might have been forming nearby these massive O, B stars can have their cores compressed by an ionizing shock wave while the outer layers are simultaneously blown away. 
which then keeps the core compact and small while there are no outer layers anymore because they've been evaporated by the turbulent winds from the OB stars. Wow. So, so, and, and I mentioned that earlier on, right? Like the, the trapezium is such a difficult place to take a picture of because there are so many of these bright, hot stars that are just overpowering the area. So what kind of energy flux is going on in this region? Were you able to calculate that? So that is something that we didn't pay too much attention to because we were looking at how close our, the jumbos were, the data from the jumbos mm -hmm. were to these regions. What we did was we calculated the radius of the H2 mm -hmm. region. And by calculating the radius, we were able to then plot the radius around these stars and plot their location in the ONC and then plot the jumbos on top and see, do these jumbos actually fall into the H2 regions of these massive stars? And that's how we came to the conclusion that it's very possible that this could have, they could have formed within this region and that could have been the reason that they've been rendered failed stars or uh, like brown dwarfs. Well, I, I think about um, like the Eagle Nebula, you know, the pillars of creation, this famous structures, these pillars, these are an example, I don't know if photo evaporation is the is the term, but you can they're being blasted away by these bright hot stars that are nearby that are causing this almost comet like appearance of these remaining regions of, of, you know, molecular gas um, is sort of and so you're saying that around every one of these really hot stars, there's this sphere of influence that is you can't withstand having any of this material nearby. And that when you map out those overlapping spheres of influence from all of those really hot stars, that catches a ton of these jumbos inside of them, statistically speaking. Statistically speaking, yes, but also there is a number in one of the equations that if varied ever so slightly, it can cause the H2 regions to be plotted a lot smaller. So there are still some that are falling into the region, but some that fall outside of the region. So this is why with a paper like ours, while it's a great and interesting idea, we would need to embellish it more and provide further simulations. And that would be something that maybe led to some more, some more, not evidence, but conclusive ideas of whether this was a possibility. Right, right. And so based on this idea, what was the precursor object? What was the jumbo before this um, sort of bullying process? So what we did was we, we weren't sure. We thought maybe it would be an M dwarf type star, for example. But when we plotted the separation distribution against all the separation distributions for the different types of star, so we put on A-type, G-type, M-type, and brown dwarf distribution, and then we plotted the jumbo separation on top of it that we got from the Pearson and McCochran paper. And then we saw that the jumbo peak peaked in the same place as an A-type peak. So we thought it could have been cause of A-type stars. But then we also plotted the masses of A-type, of cause of all types of stars against the jumbo core masses and found that they peaked in the same place or they overlapped in the same place, which meant that we actually think that these could have been cores of A-type stars that were forming within the region of OB-type stars and had their, again, cores compacted and outer layers stripped away. Right. And an A-type star, 
I'm sort of doing my OB of fine. Anyway, that's those that's like more than massive than the sun, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So you've got stars that started out more massive than the sun and yet were were photo evaporated down to something that is a a fraction of the mass of the sun, something more like Jupiter or even Saturn purely by being too close to the real monster stars. So the bigger stars, they bigger the bigger the star is, the quicker it evolves onto the main sequence because of how massive it is. So even though this is a star forming region and all stars might have started to form at the same time, because these massive stars accrete mass so quickly, they go onto the main sequence a lot quicker than these lower mass stars. So they already have their massive H2 regions, which means that they kind of can affect the other stars within their vicinity, no matter how how much they compare to the OB stars. So A is after B, but even so, A stars will take longer to evolve onto the main sequence than an OB star. So that's why, even though they are bigger than the sun, they could still form these uh, planetary mass, Jupiter mass binary objects. So, so what do you think the implications are for the stars that were smaller and less massive than the A type stars? That is a good question. And it could be that they form, there, there could be even lower mass binary systems. There could be even lower mass rogue planets out there that we just cannot find because we, even though we have this amazing sensitivity now, there's so so many objects and the only reason we're able to find them is because they're in star forming regions so they are so new and they're still thermally emitting infrared radiation so they could form even smaller binaries that we can't see like maybe what we talked about before i i mean it's really interesting that i mean i think when people consider star formation it's considered this sort of separate thing, like, okay, a star is forming in, you know, here's how a star forms, it gets its protoplanetary disk, here's how this process goes, it gets outflows of gas, it moves through the different phases of being a protostar into a main sequence star, and then it lives out its life, and then it dies, and whatever. But, but yet, stars form in these nebulae, these star forming regions, and this environment sounds like it's playing a larger and larger role in the outcome of the stars down down the road. Maybe, you know, it's this sort of nature versus nurture debate, right, at the galactic scale. Yeah, so, I mean, this is where stars form. Uh, they form in star-forming regions. And there is such a competition, you could say, in terms of how these stars, these substellar objects form, in terms of competitive accretion and all sorts of theories. Um, they're just, they have all of these dynamical interactions, but that's what causes what we see. And something like that could have been what caused how our sun got to be on its own and created our solar system. They're just random dynamical interactions that occur because they're turbulent dynamic regions. Right. But, but that it wasn't up to just the amount of material that the sun had to work with the amount of the precursor elements from supernova that had gone off nearby that a big role would have also been just the overall conditions of the star forming nebula around us and the influence of the, of the bully stars that had got rolling before the sun was able to accumulate its mass. So there's a lot of, yeah, theories yeah. on how our solar system formed that is um, going slightly off topic, but it's very interesting. And I, I know what you're referring to in terms of um, the process that it would take and how we would get so lucky in quotations in order to have been near such massive stars that could have provided us with all of the key necessities for what we have today. 
Yeah. Yeah. It, it, as always, it always gets more complicated than we, than we thought. Um, shouldn't be surprised. So now I let our Patreon community know that I was going to be interviewing you and I've got a, a, a few questions that I'm going to be getting to. Uh, this one comes from Cardwin. Uh, what are the estimated ages for the jumbos and the rogue planets that we've actually found? So do we have a sense of how old these things are? So because they are in star forming regions, we assume that they're relatively young because they are forming in these regions and they are still giving off heat. And the older, the, you, the longer you leave an object, the cooler it's going to get over time. So because we observed these using infrared, we can assume that these are relatively young because they're still giving off infrared radiation. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, now, you know, one of the other interesting discoveries that have been made fairly recently is just this idea of, of rogue planets, but not associated in a nebula. They are just floating around and we see them through gravitational microlensing and, and other ways. So, I mean, is, I mean, I don't know if you can answer this question, but you know, is this how we get rogue planets? In terms of the method that I'm... Yeah, yeah, that the rogue planets that we're finding, would we think that they are these jumbos, though they are, or that they are essentially sandblasted stars, or that they are, that they formed in place through some other mechanism where they were ejected? I think that it's a possibility. It would depend on... I think where we found them, but also it would depend on how old they are, because when you have things like micro lensing and direct imaging, they're, they're able to image objects that are not necessarily new. Whereas what we're finding is we've been able to detect them because they're in these star forming regions. Um, so it could be that this is how rogue planets form. But it would be, I think it would be more likely that they are ejected from a system because uh, if they're on their own as well, that, and this, like I've been saying with the dynamical interactions, if there's any sort of interaction with a nearby star or neighboring protoplanetary disk, this can cause planetary ejection. And I think that that would be the most common way in terms of forming rogue planets, we didn't really consider, we didn't really look at rogue planets as opposed to the jumbos. Um, and then people also haven't really considered rogue planet binaries yet either. Well, and that's what I was going to ask you. Like if we find wide rogue planet binaries, then maybe back to that original mechanism. This mechanism of yeah, yeah, erosion. Yeah, that, you know, that, that some small percentage of the rogue of the rogue planets we find out there are these leftovers from the, the nebulae as opposed to the, all of the ejected planets and so on. So one thing that's important is that these rogue, the, these jumbos currently we think if they formed in the way that we think they did, you would only be able to find them in star forming regions with massive stars. There are star forming regions that don't contain massive stars and you wouldn't expect to see them there. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, right. So that's a way to find, to find out whether or not you're on the right track. So that is a very interesting um, idea for sort of a next step is yep. to look in another star forming region with massive stars and see if James Webb can find something like this. There was one search into a star cluster recently, but I couldn't find online if it had massive stars in it. So I couldn't say if that was a sort of concrete, uh, they said that they didn't find anything, but I don't know because what we're suggesting is that they would have to form near massive stars and our paper hadn't come out before theirs had. Right. Yeah. I I feel like there were some observations done of the star forming region in the Large Magellanic Cloud 
and they had been looking for jumbos and, but it was, it's too far away. So, um, so, and this question comes from billions and billions of stars. Can rogue planets be suitable for life if there's no tidal heating from an exomoon or a binary planet? So, I mean, never say never, but I don't think so. Right. Um, I think we're struggling enough to find life on exoplanets that revolve around other stars similar to the sun, smaller than the sun, bigger than the sun. These rogue planets, I think probably one of the key keys of life is the what the what the star has to provide in terms of heat. And we know that when we're looking at our solar system and exoplanetary systems, we have something called the Goldilocks zone. And this is an important part because it's a certain distance away from the star that the star provides a natural amount of light and heat and radiation where the planet can use that to its advantage. But if you're too close, you're, you don't really have an atmosphere, it evaporates or your planet's too hot. And if you're too far away, it's too cold to sustain life. So I think that if you were a rogue planet and you were just on your own and you occasionally came near a star, unless there was some way that you could create heat in the future without a star system, then I, I don't think that life could be found on these rogue planets. I hope you're enjoying this conversation with Jessica Diamond. We took a bit of a side tour rabbit hole into Jessica's other work, not the jumbos and photo evaporation. This was sort of a insight and led to a bunch of research. But in fact, Jessica's main work is to think about galactic panspermia. What is the way that organic material could move from star to star? And we have the discovery of Oumuamua and Borisov, two objects in the solar system that came from elsewhere. There's a lot more going on. And when you think about the four and a half billion years of the solar system's history, how much material has made it into the solar system and played a role in the evolution of life on Earth. So if you're interested, I've got a much larger conversation that is available for free over on our Patreon. All you have to do is just follow us for free on Patreon. You'll get access to this interview as well as all of the other additional material that we provide to the free and paid members on Patreon. And I'll put a link in the show notes. You can access that. Uh, a question I always ask my, my guests, uh, Jessica, what are you obsessed with right now? In an astronomical sense? Or anything, but, but sure, yeah, yeah. I mean- All right, well, I think that what we just spoke about in terms of finding life on other planets, I think that exoplanetary studies and this, I think the thing that I would most want to go into in terms of my research is sort of the formation and um, evolution of these planets, you know, from the start, how they formed. Because we, we have these theories, but we can't consider our theory that we made of the solar system to be our main theory because there are so many exoplanets of different shapes and sizes that we would have never considered using our, our planetary theory of our solar system. So it would just be so interesting to be able to go into research to do with how do these exoplanets form? How do they evolve? What are their atmospheres like? How do we study their atmospheres? Using observational equipment like transits and direct imaging and just being able to kind of deep dive into the world of planet formation, evolution, exoplanets is probably something that I'm currently obsessed with because I'm also applying to graduate schools at the moment. So um, yeah, it's something that's, yeah. Well, well, good news. There's, a, there's a, a, a ton of people asking those same questions that need some help. So uh, you should be able to, to be able to apply yourself to the task. Uh, Jessica, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. And and good luck. We'll be watching to see as as more jumbos are found and and people attempt to either confirm or deny uh, the the ideas that you're proposing. 
I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Jessica Diamond. I'm going to give you some additional resources in a second, but first I'd like to thank our patrons. A special thanks to Abe Kingston, Adam Schaefer, Andrew M. Gross, Barry Lake Roofing, David Gilton, and David Matz, Dennis Alberti, Dustin Cable, James Clark, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Paul Rohrbach, scienceworldrecord.org, spiderstop.io, Stephen Krasaki, Stephen Fowler Munley and Vlad Shiplin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. I've done plenty of interviews about jumbos and rogue planets in general, and I really love this kind of story. And this is exactly the thing that I was hoping to see from the James Webb Space Telescope. Sure, we want to be able to see the kinds of processes that we understand and watch how they evolve and see what happened in the early universe. This is all great, but to see a genuinely new kind of object in a place that was never expected before and watch as the mystery unfolds in real time as people propose different ideas and we watch as these ideas compete in the realm of sort of scientific discovery. This is how a scientific consensus gets formed. You know, a lot of the ones we come after the fact and see and accept the scientific consensus. But in this case, we see something genuinely interesting. We watch as different people propose different ideas. They argue about them. Different papers come out. And eventually, 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, there will be a scientific consensus and all the implications that holds. And you're watching this process happen in real time. This is how science works. And I hope you're as entertained by it as I am. All right, we'll see you next time.